Um, the, the pictures are kind of interesting because on the upper right you have a picture of a young Ben Ferenz uh, doing his argument at Nuremberg. Ben? He's still young. He's still young, Ben Ferenz. In the bottom left, you should recognize uh, a, a younger Henry King with Albert Speer, the prosecuted Nazi who he wrote a book about. Um, of course, we have Robert Jackson, and, and the Robert Jackson Center is one of our um, co-sponsors, and it's always great to have him up there because he launched this whole era. But in the middle is Whitney Harris. And as um, President Snyder mentioned, we were supposed to have three Nuremberg prosecutors here today. We did have three Nuremberg prosecutors, but one of the sad things about Nuremberg prosecutors is they're not getting any younger. And because of health issues, Whitney was not able to be here. But he gave us the speech that he would have delivered, and it's in your materials. And so if you want to know what he would have said, but one of the things I want to do just briefly is dedicate this panel to our um, friend Whitney, who couldn't be here, who was such a great light at Nuremberg. Now, with, thank you. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Don Ferenz, who's the director of the Planet Hood Foundation. He's an adjunct professor at Pace Law School. He's also a member of the UN Working Group on the Crime of Aggression. No relation whatsoever to Ben Ferenz. <laughs> who will be chairing our first panel, The Origins of the Genocide Convention from Nuremberg to Lake Success. Don? Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, the first thing that I'd like to do is just point out that I think there's a slight misnomer in the name of our panel, The Origins of the Genocide Convention from Nuremberg to Lake Success. As many of you probably know, uh, Lake Success is where the General Assembly uh, adopted a resolution 96-1 in 1946, setting forth the uh, uh, adoption of a resolution calling it the crime of genocide an international crime. That was a non-binding resolution, but it set forth the parameters of the crime. And in fact, as some of you will know, that crime as set forth it at that time in Lake Success was slightly different than what was actually adopted in the Genocide Convention itself, which was adopted or re uh, set forth as a resolution two years later, not in Lake Success, but rather in the Palace of Chaillot in Paris. So I just want to run that a little bit forward. And they dropped, by the way, as many of you know, the definition of political groups, which was in the earlier resolution from the later convention that was put forward. So just a small item and a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, I want to mention, just as a segue from the last question that was raised, that in preparing for today, I talked to all of our panelists, and I asked people like my father and Henry and Bill, what will you be talking about? As a consequence of that, my father brought out some old documents from the 1940s, old eight and a half by 14 sheets that were yellow and pale and crumbling. It was a report written by a gentleman and a scholar named Nehemiah Robinson. I have it in my hand. It has been digitized in the last few days. It's an analysis of the Genocide Convention written in 1949 with very, very meticulous detail as to many of the underlying documents uh, behind what was meant by the Genocide Convention, including a very interesting analysis of the question of what was meant under the Convention by the duty to prevent, if in fact there is such a duty. And this will be hopefully going into, either in whole or in part, the materials that are going to be the outgrowth of this conference. So I just want to alert you to that. It's now my great privilege to introduce our three panelists who will then in succession talk to you. Henry King, who needs no introduction, uh, graduate of Yale and Yale Law School, as Mike has indicated, at the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg. My father, Benjamin Ferenc, notwithstanding Michael's disclaimers. Uh, it is my father, Benjamin Ferenc, who was a graduate of the Harvard Law School, uh, the chief prosecutor at the young age of 27 at the Einsatzgruppen trial in Nuremberg. I myself was born in Nuremberg because my father stayed on after the war there. And Bill Chavis, who is the director of the Irish Center for Human Rights, who has written extensively on the International Criminal Court and the crime of genocide, and with whom I had the privilege of visiting the grave of Raphael Lemkin last week at Mount Hebron Cemetery in Queens, New York. So without any further ado, Henry, you're on. OK. I first saw Raphael Lemkin, the man who identified genocide as an international crime, and who in fact coined the word genocide in the Grand Hotel in Nuremberg in 1946. At that time, he was unshaven. His clothing was in tatters, and he looked disheveled. When I saw him at Nuremberg, 
Lemkin was very upset. He was concerned with the decision of the International Military Tribunal, the Nuremberg Court, did not go far enough in dealing with genocidal actions. This was because the IMT limited its judgment to wartime genocide and did not include peacetime genocide. At that time, Lemkin was very focused on pushing his points. After he had buttonholed me several times, I had to tell him that I was powerless to do anything about the limitation in the court's judgment. To sum up, I thought Lemkin Lemkin was a crank at the time, and I gave him, <laughs> I gave him short trip. But Lemkin, despite his appearance, was to have a vital role in pushing genocide as an international crime and in the development of the United Nations Convention on Genocide. Raphael Lemkin was a Polish Jewish lawyer whose family was decimated by the Nazis. His interest in what was to be known as genocide starts with concern over the unpunished Turkish massacre of hundreds of thousands of Armenians. The Turkish official who have ordered the massacre was not brought to trial, but the young man who allegedly assassinated him was. Lemkin saw a great anomaly between the situation of an individual who had allegedly committed a single murder being put on trial for his life while the instigator of the massacre of thousands of people went scot-free. He wanted to correct this injustice. So in the 1930s, Remkin prepared a draft of a law that would punish those who committed the destruction of peace, people for racial, religious, or national origin reasons. And he wanted the concept of universal jurisdiction to apply to the law's enforcement of those that committed these crimes so that they could be tried wherever they were caught, regardless of where the crime was committed, and regardless of the defendant's nationality or official status. Lemkin worked for years to get this law adopted, and he was at Nuremberg to pursue this objection when I first met him in 1946. By genocide, we generally mean the destruction of a national or racial religious group. This definition is from the Greek word genus, race or tribe, and the Latin word side, killing. The importance of abolishing genocide is about learning to value diversity. As Raphael Lemkin wrote in 1945, quote, our whole cultural heritage is a product of the contributions of all nations. We can best understand when we realize how impoverished our culture would be that the peoples doomed by Germany, such as the Jews, who had, had not been permitted to create the Bible or to give birth to an Einstein or a Spinoza, the Poles had not had the opportunity to give the world a Copernicus, a Chopin, a Curie, the Czechs, a Hughes or a Dvorak, the Greeks, a Plato or an Isakovic, the Russians, a Tolstoy and a Shostakovich. Hitler's concept of a master race, namely the Germans, brought the Nazis into direct conflict with those who favored diversity. Hitler wanted to dignify genocide as a sacred purpose of the German people. National socialism was, in his mind, the doctrine of the biological superiority, superiority, superiority of the German people. A hierarchy of racial values determined the ultimate fate of many people that fell under German domination. Jews and gypsies were to be completely annihilated. The Poles, the Slavines, the Czechs, the Russians, and all other inferior Slav peoples were to be kept on the lowest social level. Those felt to be related by blood, the Dutch, the Norwegians, the Alsatians, were to have an alternative of espousing Germanism or sharing the fate of the inferior people. Raphael Lemkin coined the word genocide in 1945, for and in 1945, Robert Jackson, the ar architect of Nuremberg, was charged by President Harry S. Truman with the trial of the major North Nazi war criminals. At the time of Jackson's appointment, enough was known of the genocide activities of the Nazis to recognize that this would be one of the points of focus at the trial. Jackson was appointed on May 2, 1945, and he reported back to President Truman on June 6, 1945, with a plan for the conduct of the trials, including in that report as crimes with the trials to deal with, 
where, quote, atrocities and persecutions on racial and religious grounds committed since 1933, end of quote. These genocidal activities were to be included in the crimes with which the Nazis were to be charged. Jackson's recognition of genocidal activity as a tr crime was the first of its kind in an international criminal proceeding. Jackson also recognized that genocidal activity could take place in peacetime as well as wartime. When in his report to President Truman, he specified that the trials should cover genocidal crimes occurring, quote, since 1933, end of quote. Jackson had been charged by President Truman to negotiate with the Allies, the United Kingdom, France, and USSR, a procedure for the trial of the major Nazi war criminals. These negotiations took place in London in the early summer of 1945. Negotiations were difficult at times, particularly with the USSR, but were, successfully, were eventually successful. The result was the London Charter of August 8, 1945. Genocidal activity was specified as a crime under the London Charter, but was on its face limited to wartime genocide. Implicitly, it did not include peacetime genocide. The Crimes Against Humanity references as follows, quote, Article 6C, crimes against humanity, namely murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation, and other, un hum other hum inhumane acts committed against any civilian populations before or during the war, or persecutions on political, racial, or religious grounds in the execution of or in connection with any crime within the jurisdiction of the tribunal, whether or not, whether or not, in violation of the domestic law of the country were perpetrated, end of quote. This definition was hurtful and helpful to the development of a definition of the crime of genocide activity. As a matter of fact, first, as a matter of first instance, it said that, quote, persecution on political, racial, and religious grounds, end of quote, was actionable only when committed in execution of or in connection with any crime within the jurisdiction of the tribunal. This meant that such activity was condemned only when related to crimes against peace or war crimes. Thus, in the opinion of the International Military Tribunal, the Nuremberg Court, only wartime genocide was deemed actionable. But the definition was helpful in another respect when it held that such persecution, when it held such persecution to be a, a crime quote, whether or not in violation of the domestic law of the country were perpetrated, end of quote. In other words, German law was to be of no relevance with regard to the punishment for these crimes. More specifically, German law could not authorize such crimes. The test in, in, in judging these crimes was implicitly to be international law and not local law. Read in the abstract, this was indeed an important limitation on sovereignty and one that was to prove helpful in dealing with such crimes subsequently. Genocide activity was recognized as a crime in the indictment against the Nazis on October 6, 1945, when in accusing them it stated, quote, they, the defendants, conducted deliberately and systematically genocide by the extermination of racial and national groups against the civilian population of certain occupied territories in order to destroy particular races and classes of people and national, racial, or religious groups, particularly Jews, Poles, and Gypsies, and others, end of quote. The trial began on November 20th, 1945, and for almost a year, the court and the world heard of the genocidal activities of the Nazis with such evidence coming primarily from the Nazis from the documents of the Nazis' own making. The evidence produced at Nuremberg did indeed give full support to the charge of genocide. Raphael Lemkin was particularly impressed with the statements by Sir Hartley Shawcross and Sir David Maxwell Fife the British prosecution, of the British prosecution, and Augustus Champetier de Ribes and Charles de Vos for the French prosecution, who elaborated at length with great eloquence on the crime of genocide in the course of the Nuremberg proceedings. Lemkin also com commented favorably on the work of Brigadier General Telford Taylor in the subsequent proceedings who used the concept of genocide 
to good effect. For example, in the case of the Nazi doctors who experimented on captive human beings. In this case, the defendants performed experiments in order to develop techniques for outright killings and abortions on the one hand, and castration and sterilization on the other. Certainly, the commission of these crimes against Jews, Poles, and others fit the Nazi genocidal ambitions. The United Nations General Assembly on December 11, 1946, broadly endorsed the Nuremberg Principles as reflected in the IPMT judgment and by separate resolution affirmed the principle of genocide as a crime. The adoption of the resolution relating to genocide was followed by a push toward the drafting and adoption of a UN convention relating to genocide. This was accomplished in December 1948, and with sufficient ratification, the convention went into effect in 1951. Even the United States has now ratified the fourth convention after 40 years of scrutiny and with significant reservations. First reservation in the United States related to Article Roman 9 of the Convention. Article Roman 9 of the Convention provides that disputes concerning the application of the Convention, including those relating to the responsibility of the state for genocide, shall be set up and submitted to the International Court of Justice. The U.S. reservation to the Convention states that with respect to any disputes involving the United States, such disputes may only be submitted to the International Court of Justice with the specific consent of the United States. That consent is required in each case. The second reservation of the United States was to the effect that nothing in the Convention requires or authorizes legislation or other action by the United States prohibited by the United States Constitution as interpreted by the United States. These reservations are crippling. They mean that no case regarding the enforcement of the Convention involving the United States is to be brought before the International Court of Justice without the consent of the United States. Further, the United States shall be the sole judge as to whether actions required on the Convention are prohibited by the Constitution of the United States. In light of the above, that one might conclude that the adherence of the United States to the Convention was more symbolic than binding in actuality. Most of the countries in the world have now ratified the Genocide Convention. Genocide was the basis for the conviction of Adolf Eichmann by Israel in 1962. In the 1930s, the UN Security Council, by resolution, established tribunals at The Hague in Tanzania to cover, among other crimes, genocide in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. The International Criminal Court, which went into effect in 2002, includes the crime of genocide as a separate offense within its purview, in addition to crimes against humanity and war crimes, and aggression when defined. Genocide provisions as implemented in all these four are direct descendants of genocide as charged at Nuremberg, although the latter have more particularity. Genocide is defined in the Rome Statute establishing the International Criminal Court and encompasses peacetime genocide as well as wartime genocide. Nuremberg was largely the creation of Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson. In his report to President Harry S. Truman on June 6, 1945, which outlined a blueprint for Nuremberg, Jackson proposed the elimination of the defense, defenses of sovereign immunity, acts of state, and superior orders. This recommendation became a part of the London Charter of August 8, 1945, upon which the trial was based. These two features became very significant to the recognition of genocide as a crime against humanity. Four, when asked why he carried out the extermination of 2,500,000 individuals at Auschwitz, Rudolf Post, the Auschwitz Commandant, said he was carrying out orders that because of Jackson's foresight in drafting the London Charter, this was to be no excuse for Hose's misdeeds. Similarly, Alo Ollendorf, when questioned why he ordered the extermination of 90,000 Jews, gypsies, and Russian commissars in southern Russia, answered that he was ordered to do so. Both Hose and Ollendorf were sentenced to death by hanging for their crimes. More of the elimination of the defense of sovereign immunity by Jackson and his plan for Nuremberg, which also, which also 
uh, which was also included in the subsequent structures for war crimes trials, is the reason Slobodan Milosevic was before the Bar of Justice at The Hague. And why Saddam Hussein and Pinochet have been called to account for what they did as sovereigns. The other area in which Jackson played a role in holding those who carried out genocidal acts responsible for those acts was his advocacy of the principle of universal jurisdiction. The concept of, of universal jurisdiction is a long standing in international law, stemming from its application from the 17th century onward to pirates. So long as the nation trying them had physical possession of the individuals. In his opening statement at ja in Nuremberg, Jackson said, and I quote, quote, the real complaining party at your bar is civilization, end of quote. This was paralleled by his statement, quote, to pass these defendants a poison chalice is to put it to our lips as well. The Nuremberg Court, the International Military Tribunal, went along with the concept of uni universal jurisdiction when it said in its judgment that the four plaintiff nations at Nuremberg were doing collectively what each could have done individually. Richard Goldstone, the first prosecutor at the Hague proceedings, said that universal jurisdiction is the most important principle derived from Nuremberg. The principle of universal jurisdiction, particularly applicable to extreme international crimes such as genocide. In 1962, Adolf Eichmann was charged in Israel with genocide. His defense was that Israel was not a state when the crime was committed, so that he could not be charged with a violation of Israeli law. The Israeli court brushed aside this defense and held that Eichmann's crimes were so terrible that the doctrine of universal jurisdiction applied and he could be tried for them in any court in any country, regardless of where they had been committed. Thus, Eichmann was sentenced to hang based on the Israeli court's adoption of the principle of universal jurisdiction. There's another significant way in which Nuremberg added to the development of the recognition of genocide as an international crime. This was in the draft of the Crimes Against Humanity provision in the London Charter. In this provision it was stated in effect that the law of Germany, Germany provided no excuse for those charged with such crimes. In other words, Hitler's orders to implement the final solution could not be used as defense by car those carrying it out. This was truly an invasion of sovereignty as it, be under as it had been previously understood. But it gave genocide status a crime over and above national boundaries. Specifically, local law or the orders of local officialdom could no longer justify criminal activities such as genocide. A higher law. International law, which included genocide as a crime, was to be the order of the day. The conviction and hanging of individuals at Nuremberg for genocidal activity was also important to the acceptance of genocide as a crime. The conviction of Jules Steiker, the Jew baiter of Nuremberg, is a case in point. In finding Stryker guilty, the International Military Tribunal stated, quote, Stryker's incitement to murder and extermination at the time when Jews in the East were being killed under most horrible conditions clearly constitutes persecution on political and racial grounds in connection with war crimes as defined by the Charter and constitutes a crime against humanity. Nuremberg indeed made an important contribution to the recognition of genocidal activities as criminal when it included the, among the crimes charged persecution on political and racial and religious grounds, and when it excluded domestic law as justification for such crimes. International Military Tribunal judgment's limitation to cover only wartime genocide was not followed in Control Council Law Number 10 of December 20th, 1945, which governed the Nuremberg subsequent proceedings. This law governed peacetime genocide as well as wartime genocide. Twelve subsequent proceedings were conducted 12 subsequent proceedings trials were conducted under this law. In conclusion, there is an old adage, quote, that goes, you can't, you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, end of quote. This certainly applied in the case of Raphael Lemkin as I knew him at Nuremberg. <laughs> he was disheveled and rough cut as he appeared to me, but he possessed a soul which had a steely determination to correct a national and international wrong 
and the world is better for it today. For it's Lemkin's determination to identify and codify genocide that made genocide a front burner crime at Nuremberg. Our world today is much better for his efforts. The Genocide Convention, the structures, the ad hoc tribunals at The Hague, Sierra Leone, and Tanzania, as well as that of the International Criminal Court, are all very explicit in, in, in identifying genocide as an international crime of the greatest magnitude. It's one of the great coincidences of history that Robert Jackson's emergent as a leader in the international com legal community almost coincided with Lemkin's definition of genocide and the publication of his critical book, Axis Rule in Occupied Europe, outlining in particular the genocidal activities of the Nazi regime. Jackson, in his report to President Truman of June 6, 1945, stated that, quote, personal persecution on racial or religious grounds should be one of the basis for the trials of the Nazi. This was, approach was followed in the London Charter of August 8, 1945, which pro provided for the basis of the Nuremberg trial. Jackson followed up his focus on genocide and the indictment of the Nazi leaders on August, October 6, 1945, when in the indictment he references genocide as one of the crimes with which the Nazis were charged. Genocide conducted on the scale in which the Nazis conducted it requires participation by considerable numbers of people acting on the leadership of key officials by eliminating the defenses of sovereign immunity and superior orders Jackson wanted to call it to account those who carried out genocide and other crimes and to punish them accordingly. This gave bite to the crime of genocide. Moreover, Jackson's approach in eliminating these two defenses was replicated in the structure of the ad hoc tribunals at The Hague, Sierra Leone, and Tanzania, and the Rome Statute established in the International Criminal Court. Finally, implicit in Jackson's approach, as reflected in his opening and closing statement, is the principle that, like genocide, some international crimes are so heinous they can be subject of trials in any court that is willing to take jurisdiction over them. This approach removes technical, jur ob technical jurisdiction obstacles to such trials. The principle of universal jurisdiction certainly provided the base for the trial of Adolf Eichmann in the Israeli courts for his monstrously genocidal activity. Moreover, the principle of universal jurisdiction is incorporated in the tr torture convention of the UN. And it was used in, by the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals to, correct, uh, to convict John DeMania. It is also incorporated in the restatement of the foreign relations law of the United States, which it closed with an acknowledgement of respect and gratitude for Raphael Lemkin and Robert Jackson as recognition for their activities in creating a better world for all of us. Genocide remains a crime in today's world, but those who commit it are now being tried and punished for their acts. Hopefully, this will dissuade others from the commission of the crime of genocide. At war's end, Raphael Lemkin said that we needed diversity for the world to progress. What he said was true then and is emphatically more true today in the highly mechanized and technologically oriented world in which we live. As our world grows smaller, our appreciation for diversity must grow larger. With regard to Robert Jackson, his contribution, the recognition of punishment of genocide as a crime against at Nuremberg, I can say emphatically that there would have been no Nuremberg without Robert Jackson. It was his creation, as he put it so well, quote, this is the first case I have ever tried where I had to persuade others that a court should be established. Help negotiate this establishment. And when that was done, not only to prepare my case, but find a courtroom in which to try it. Thank you for letting me share with you my experience at Nuremberg, which brought for me, and I believe others, a new dawn of hope for a better world for all of mankind. Thank you.
We were on a very tight schedule today, as you know, and uh, what I'll try to do is to try to summarize for you my personal observations, my personal experiences, and my personal conclusions with regard to the subject which we're supposed to be dealing with. The title of the program is To Prevent and to Punish and uh, a commemoration of the 60th anniversary. This particular panel was supposed to address the subject of, uh, if I can find it, uh, the origins of the Genocide Convention. Well, the origins, there are two types of origins. One, the technical ones, how the proposal went through the United Nations machinery. As my son Donald has pointed out, I did have in my archives a 75-page report by one of the very active participants as an NGO, non-governmental organization representative, Nehemia Robinson, meeting with Lemkin and with Pella and with the others who pushed this through. It's 75 pages, 74 pages, I believe, with the precise citation of every single step as it went through the United Nations machinery. So there you have the most authentic and uh, articulate and clearest presentation of the origins as far as the structure of the convention itself were concerned. The real origins, however, go back to Nuremberg and what was revealed at the Nuremberg trials, the Holocaust itself. There had been atrocities, of course, of similar magnitude or related somewhat similar magnitude in other parts of the world since time immemorial. The extermination of the Incas comes quickly to mind without getting into disputes of whether uh, uh, the uh, events in 1915 in, in Turkey and the Armenians constituted uh, genocide or not. For the victim, it doesn't matter what you call it. You've just killed his entire family and his friends or those who had a different belief. and. Uh, you may give it a name to stigmatize it and to emphasize how outrageous it is and to identify it more readily, which has a useful purpose. But genocide wasn't invented by Lemkin. He invented the term. And in fact, the term genocide is not within the competence, it was not within the competence of the International Military Tribunal. They had three crimes listed, the most important one of which was the crime against peace commonly known as aggression, aggressive war. The second one were crimes against humanity, which was an evolutionary progression from statements which had been made in the past about the dictates of the human conscience and uh, the need for humanity and so on. It was an articulation of that, which of course would include crimes of the magnitude of what we now call genocide. They were clearly crimes against humanity as well. And war crimes, which was the third category of crimes authorized by the IMT statute, uh, were war crimes, which had been prohibited since uh, uh, 1898. And uh, even before that, the American Civil War, they had drawn up codes of crimes. So I don't want to go into any of those things, but rather to tell you my personal observations. I was a witness to what is now called genocide. As a soldier in the American Army, uh, after serving about three years in combat from the beaches of Normandy through every battle to the final battle of the Bulge, I was assigned to investigate the crimes being committed in the concentration camps that had been committed there, as well as the murder of Allied flyers, which wouldn't rise to a crime of genocide. But in the camps, as I entered Buchenwald with the liberating forces in Mauthausen and Ebensee and a whole host of other camps to collect the evidence of the crimes, I witnessed the effects of genocide. Dead people lying all around the floor. Uh, you didn't know if they were dead or alive. Uh, I don't want to go into the horrors of it. First, we don't have time. And secondly, it's really not comprehensible to a normal, rational mind that human beings could be treated that way. And I saw the consequences. Later, I got to know the murderers, the mass murderers, and got to know their mentality. And if you're talking about prevention, which of course is the most important aspect of our subject today, prevention and punishment, prevention requires that you understand 
the mentality of the killers. Are they sadistic beasts who are out for the joy or for pleasure or whatever it may be? They are not. They are people who could be sitting in this room. And I will give you a more specific example, but I think we might introduce some of that by some photographic material, which my son Donald, who is more adept at uh, pushing those gadgets than I am, uh, has uh, unearthed somewhere. And uh, if you can get it up here, we'll put it on the screen. And what you're going to witness is the opening of what was certainly the biggest murder trial in human history, the classic case of genocide where the defendants, 22 of them, originally 24, two of them dropped out, uh, the uh, defendants were accused of murdering in cold blood over a million human beings, including men, women, invalids, and children. Uh, that was known as the Einsatzgruppen trial because the people who were to carry that job out were special extermination squads camouflaged with the name Einsatzgruppen, which means action groups. Uh, when the trial opened in the Nuremberg Courthouse, this is what the audience saw and which I hope you will now be able to share. Well, you now have the text, but you should have the sound as well, except there was a gift. You're now ready to hear the presentation by the prosecution. At that point, there was a glitch. What I said, in fact, after that was, may it please your honors, it is with sorrow and with hope that we here disclose the deliberate slaughter of more than a million innocent and defenseless men, women, and children. The tape then picks it up from there and goes on If it goes on, it will. To say, here we go. We are now ready to hear the presentation by the prosecution. You've already heard the opening sentence. This was the tragic fulfillment of a program of intolerance and arrogance. Vengeance is not our goal, nor do we seek merely a just retribution. We ask this court to affirm by international penal action man's right to live in peace and dignity regardless of his race or creed. The case we present is a plea of humanity to law. We shall establish beyond the realm of doubt facts which before the dark decade of the Third Reich would have seemed incredible. Courts will show that the slaughter committed by these defendants was dictated not by military necessity, but by that supreme perversion of thought, the Nazi theory of the master race. We shall show that these deeds of men in uniform were the methodical execution of long-range plans to destroy ethnic, national, political, and religious groups which stood condemned in the Nazi mind. Genocide, the extermination of whole categories of human beings, was a foremost instrument of the Nazi doctrine. So there you have the opening of what was not a very long trial, it was based upon the official top secret reports which we captured disclosing exactly which units had killed how many people in which towns, who was the commanding officer of the unit, where they moved on to. We had captured those documents. I took them down from Berlin where these documents were found to General Telford Taylor who was the chief of counsel, later my law partner, a distinguished professor at Columbia University, uh, and said we have to put on a new trial. He said we can't. We don't have budget for it. It's not been included in the original plans. The Pentagon has not approved. I pleaded with him. He understood the importance of it. 
And he said, can you handle it in addition to your other work? I said, I could. He said, you've got it. So I became the chief prosecutor of the biggest murder trial in history. As had been indicated, I was then 27 years old. It was my first case. <laughs> I, I didn't have enough experience to spread it out a little bit. I rested my case after two days. The defendants came in with their alibis and lies. That took about five months or so to clean that up. And they were all convicted, and 13 of them were sentenced to death. They were among the defendants, were six SS generals. They were all selected by virtue of their rank and their education. Most of them had doctor degrees. Dr. Dr. Rush, very nice man otherwise, I guess. He managed to execute 33,771 Jews, according to his report, on note the anniversary, 29, 30 September, 1941. We have an anniversary. We have another anniversary. What you heard there was on 28 September 1947, when he was put on trial together with the other defendants. But to understand the mentality, the best man to listen to was Dr. Otto Oledorf, doctor of economics, father of five children, handsome young man, who was relatively honest, and he explained not merely that it was superior orders, as Henry King has pointed out, but the rationale. He said it was self-defense. Self-defense? Soviet Union was not attacking you. Uh, you attacked Belgium, Holland, France, Sweden, Norway. How do you get away with self-defense? Ah, he said, we knew that they were planning to attack us. And we knew that the Soviets would not be bound by any rules. And so, in anticipation, we launched an anticipatory strike to defend ourselves. And that was his principal line of defense, saying I couldn't challenge the Fuhrer. He had more information than I had. I was in no position to do that. So I carried out that obligation, and I would do it again in defense of the nation. When you're talking about genocide, most of the people and most of the genocides are done in defense presumed defense of some particular ideal, whether it be religion, whether it be the ideology, whether it be race, whether it be neighborhood, nationalism. These are the things which motivate people to go out and kill and be ready to be killed to protect their own conception of what the world should be like. You've got to understand that. These are not wild, raving maniacs. You cannot kill an idea with a gun. You can only change it by a better idea. And that's something we have to recognize as well. Now, how do you go about changing it? It's very difficult to change the way people think when it relates to such a strongly held and indoctrinated ideal as I have indicated. But it can be done. It certainly can be done. But it takes a long time and perseverance. To give you some examples, we can go back to slavery. Uh, slavery was the basis for a civil war in the United States because our vital interests were at stake. The economy of the country, the rights of women. Our Constitution provided they couldn't vote, they couldn't hold property, completely changed. We have many things. If we had time, we could, of course, go into that. But uh, the ideas of sovereignty itself is an obsolete notion. We live in an interdependent world today. Look at the gadget here. You push the button and right away you're in China or in India or someplace else in the world. And the notion that a sovereign state can do whatever it wishes within its own borders, which was what troubled Jackson and others at the beginning of the IMT trial. How do you get into crimes committed before there's an international conflict of some kind? Uh, the whole notion has got to change. How are you going to change that when everybody's ready to waved the flag for his own particular country. Now, I was in Budapest last week. Uh, if everybody wants to eat goulash in Budapest, they should have the right to do that. But if they say, if you don't eat it, I'll kill you, that goes a bit too far, even if you like goulash. So uh, we have to know that there are limits to what can be done. Now, the punishment itself 
doesn't operate in a vacuum. We live in a political atmosphere. We see it every day. And we are affected by the circumstances where we try to punish. By the time you're around to punishment, you have already failed. Uh, genocide has been pointed out by Juan Mendez, who articulately the different steps that have to be gone through. I don't need to repeat them here. I have no time for it. But the punishment is the minor step, a very important one, because it tells the victims, we care, we know what happened. We set a historical record which is indisputable. There are some people who still deny the Holocaust, not in my presence, for their safety. But if you look at the reports in the Wannsee building in Berlin where they lay out the plans, how do you go about murdering 12 million people? And who, is the, who are the people figuring this out? These are doctors, lawyers, professors, uh, people in the SS of the highest intelligence. What if a man's grandmother was Jewish and his grandfather wasn't? Does he get on the first ship and out? Uh, what do you do if he has a, was a hero in the war and so on? And they are planning the deliberate murder of over 12 million people and how they murdered the children. I won't go into that here because I know exactly how they murdered the children and bashed their heads against the tree to save ammunition is one way, but there are others. Anyway, what can you do about it? Maybe the question. You can do a lot about it. And if you think, what can one individual do? Look to Lemkin. Uh, as Henry King described him, I thought he was a nudnik too. Uh, <laughs> but, but I took him seriously. He gave me his book. And for that reason, in that opening minute of the Einsatzgruppen trial, although it was not within the statute of that time of either the IMT or the Control Council Law Number 10, genocide is not listed as a crime, I said, this is genocide. And it was the classic case of genocide, and I was thinking of Lemkin when I did that. So you can have other individuals. I was in Hamburg last week, too. There we have the law of the sea, and I'm about to be floated away. <laughs> there I saw one man, Albert Pardo, created the, the instigation for that great court. Oh, well, what does it mean to you? It says I have to stop, and I will. I think we all have an obligation never to stop trying. I got a two-minute reprieve from my son. <laughs> All right, I yield to the chair. Uh, what does it mean to you? I could list many people where one individual made a difference uh, the, regarding the environment, regarding the law of the sea, regarding the International Criminal Court. A. N. R. Robinson put it on the agenda from a big country, Trinidad and Tobago. I even know his name is August Napoleon. A -N, N is Nathan R Napoleon uh, Robinson, an, an unknown name of an, from a country which is very minor. If you have enough drive and persistence and keep with it, you can change the world. Um, and do you have an obligation to change it? I think you do. I've been working on it for 50 or 60 years. And uh, I think we owe it to the memory of those who've perished. We owe it to the children that some of you have or will have never to stop trying. The progress has been fantastic, fantastic. You will hear from judges here who sat on international courts. When I went to school, there was no such thing as international criminal law. There was no such thing as international courts. You'll hear they're bubbling out everywhere. Cambodia, ICTY, ICTR, you can't remember the names. This is a revolution which is taking place, and it's being all supported by this little gadget. It's got a little gadget in his pocket. The young people, just cut me off. The young people <laughs> can save the world by your new education, to answer your question. It begins in the cradle, and given enough determination, one or two generations, maybe sooner, I don't know, maybe longer, we will have created the more humane world, which we tried to create at Nuremberg, and which Lemkin stood for as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ben and Henry. I feel very uh, humbled to even be uh, put on the same platform with the two of you. And uh, I do. And, uh, um, I guess thanks are due to my dear friend Michael Scharf for, uh, for assigning me to this uh, slot in the program. Uh, Don mentioned that the title of our uh, session today, From Nuremberg to Lake Success, might have been 
uh, a bit of a, um, a bit erroneous because, of course, the Genocide Convention was adopted in Paris uh, in December of 1948. Michael has titled the conference the 60th anniversary, but he's He's jumped the year. It's really the 59th anniversary, isn't it? Um, and I think that, and somewhere in the materials, uh, this is pointed out, that it's the 59th anniversary of the first draft of the Genocide Convention, what, what's called the Secretariat Draft, that was part of the drafting process, and it was prepared by three experts, uh, Lemkin, uh, about whom much has been said, Vaspasian Pella, who was a Romanian international criminal lawyer who had had a long association with Lemkin, and uh, Henri uh, Dandieu de Vabre, who had been one of the French judges at the Nuremberg trial. The title, Nuremberg from Nuremberg to Lake Success, is interesting, and I think it's the relationship with Nuremberg, because in my view, the genocide you mentioned uh, was a result of a reaction to the Nuremberg judgment. It was an attempt to fix things that were wrong with Nuremberg. Uh, it's not just a logical progression, but rather an attempt to to correct uh, an anomalous situation that resulted, as Henry has pointed out, from the fact that Nuremberg only prosecuted what he has called wartime genocide. And let me try and explain that a little more. If we go back to the beginnings of the uh, organization of the prosecutions at Nuremberg, we're talking late 1943, the Moscow Declaration, and then the creation of what was called the United Nations War Crimes Commission, which met in London over 1944 and 45, and, and uh, prepared a lot of the groundwork for the London Conference. The name of that body, I think, says it all, the United Nations War Crimes Commission. They thought they were prosecuting classic war crimes as they'd been identified at the end of the First World War by bodies like the Commission on Responsibilities. And uh, over the course of 1944, uh, as it became obvious that other terrible acts have been committed by the Nazis, pressure grew that they would expand the concept of war crimes by, first of all, dealing with a crime that hadn't figured in the original plans and had been subject of debate since 1919, what Ben Ferenc has mentioned, the crime, crime against peace, crimes against peace. And the other was what was called, I think most commonly during those meetings, the crime of uh, atrocity, deportation, and persecution, or names along those lines the ancestor of what ultimately became crimes against humanity. That was opposed initially by the main participants in the London, in the, the United Nations War Crimes Commission, particularly the foreign ministries of Britain and the United States, who were the big players, and their initial reaction when it was proposed to prosecute the Nazis for atrocities committed against their own civilians, not in the occupied territories, but within Germany, was that these crimes were not governed by international law that they could not prosecute them. They were not subject to international law. And over the course of 1944 and 45, as a result of lobbying, intensive lobbying, mainly by Jewish NGOs in London, the, the corner was turned on this, and gradually it was accepted that you could not hold proper prosecutions uh, following the war and leave these crimes untouched, the crimes, the atrocities that had been committed within Germany uh, against German nationals. And that led ultimately in uh, June, July, and August to the London Conference where the architecture of the Nuremberg trial was set up. We can read about this in the, uh, the proceedings of the conference which were prepared by Jackson, by Robert Jackson. He brought his secretary along from Washington and she took uh, stenographic notes and then they were later published here in the United States. Uh, and these are, we don't have an official record of the London Conference, but we have this unofficial record prepared by Jackson. And there's a very interesting moment late in July of 1945 when he says, we, the United States, are prepared to recognize crimes against humanity, that is, atrocities, persecutions, and deportations, committed against Germans, German nationals, within Germany, but on one condition. He said, we have to have a connection with the war. It has to be related to war crimes or to <coughs> crimes against peace. And he explained why. He said, we don't want to recognize a broader principle whereby states and individuals are responsible for atrocities committed against civilian populations at all times. Because he said, we have in our own country minorities who are victims 
of such crimes, of such persecutions, and we're not prepared to recognize that this be subject to international law. Now, Jackson was a Roosevelt Democrat, a very fine man, and I'm sure he wasn't proud of the reality that he had to confront, which at that time in the United States was a system of apartheid, in effect, in many of the states directed against the African-American population. He had around the table with him the three other delegations, the Soviets, the French, and the British, in the case of the British and the French with extensive colonial empires, and this resonated with all of them. All three of them were nervous and uncomfortable with the idea of the recognition of peacetime atrocities. As long as they had the connection with the war, with the aggressive war, the crime could be directed against the Nazis, but it wouldn't come back to bite them. And they codified that in the, the charter that was adopted on the 8th of August, 1945. It was confirmed in the judgment of the Nuremberg Tribunal, of the International Military Tribunal, on the 30th of September and the 1st of October. The term genocide had been used. Ben points out how he used it. We saw it in his opening address in the Einsatzgruppen trial. It was also used in the summation uh, at the end of July of 1946 by uh, the French uh, prosecutor, Champetier de Ribes. It was used by Shawcross in his remarks. I think at the time, people like Shawcross and Champetier de Ribes and Ben Ferenc uh, and Raphael Lemkin all saw crimes against humanity and genocide as being terms that overlapped neatly. Um, they were cognates. They were two ways of describing the same reality, which was the atrocities committed by the Nazis. Not quite synonyms, but close to it. But it was in reaction to the fatal uh, link of crimes against humanity with armed conflict that so limited the scope and the, the legal consequences of the Nuremberg Judgment that a few days later, literally days after the Nuremberg Judgment in 1946, at the very first session of the United Nations General Assembly, three other nations, not the great powers, not the United States, the United Kingdom, um, I have more than two minutes. I do, because I only started eight minutes ago. I'm keeping track. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, it was in reaction to, to this that three other countries, uh, Panama, Cuba, and India. India wasn't even yet a, a state. It was yet to become truly independent, but it got into the United Nations at the beginning because the Russians got Ukraine and the United States got South America. And uh, so they all had their, their, their networks in there. And, and, and so these three countries came and proposed, and they said it in the speech. It was the Cuban delegate to the General Assembly. He said, we're unhappy with the Nuremberg Judgment because of the limitation on crimes against humanity, and we propose to fix it. And we're going to fix it with a resolution that will uh, define genocide as an international crime. And they said, what we want to do, we want to accomplish two things. We want, uh, as a consequence of the recognition of genocide as an international crime, to have it recognized that it can be committed in peacetime. Number one, fixing Nuremberg. And number two, we want to recognize universal jurisdiction for genocide. They succeeded with one. They failed with the other. But they couldn't get the General Assembly in 1946 to agree to confirm that there was universal jurisdiction for the crime of genocide. They failed again two years later. They couldn't get it in the Genocide Convention. The Genocide Convention in Article 6 says that it's only the state with territorial jurisdiction or the future International Criminal Court that can exercise jurisdiction over genocide. But they did succeed with the recognition that genocide could be committed in time of peace. And so I think if we look back in this, this crucial period where genocide is codified, where the convention, the origins of the convention exist, somewhere between Nuremberg and Lake Success, as Michael has titled it on this panel, um, we, can, we can come to, I think, another interesting conclusion, that, that had Nuremberg not confirmed the connection between crimes against humanity and armed conflict, we probably wouldn't have a genocide convention. There would have been nothing to fix. And genocide would have been a word that people like Ben Ferenc used as a synonym for crimes against humanity, but we never would have had this, um, this new instrument. Um, there are other things that the genocide convention accomplished, but I think that had crimes against humanity been recognized in its broader uh, context, we probably would have had a convention 
on crimes against humanity that would give jurisdiction to the International Court of Justice and so on. Well, we all know that that situation has changed now, that uh, crimes against humanity are now clearly and without doubt recognized as crimes that can be committed in time of peace. Something happened between 1945 and 1995 or 1998 when this became finally well accepted. Uh, Robert Petit is going to be arguing that it happened rather closer to 1945 uh, in the Cambodian Extraordinary Chambers than closer to 1995. But if we go back to the 40s, we can find certainly uh, as well other evidence of this link between crimes against humanity and armed conflict. We can see it in the debates of the General Assembly as the, as the, Gene as the Genocide Convention was being adopted. Not only did the Cuban delegate in October of 1946 say, we have to fix this problem with the Nuremberg judgment. Over the next year or so, there were frequent suggestions that the Genocide Convention acknowledge a, a relationship with crimes against humanity, that a reference be added somewhere in the convention. It wasn't in the Lemkin Pella uh, Secretariat draft. It wasn't there. They didn't say anything about crimes against humanity because they knew the problem. And uh, I wasn't aware of the that's the first time I'd heard of Henry's conversation with Raphael Lemkin in October of 1946 in Nuremberg about Lemkin's dissatisfaction with the Nuremberg judgment. But it seems to confirm this phenomenon that I'm describing. And so over 46 and 47 and into 48, as the Genocide Convention is being adopted, there are these attempts to inject a reference to crimes against humanity, and they're constantly rejected. And it's ultimately defeated precisely because any association in 1947 and 48 of genocide and crimes against humanity would have fatally weakened the Genocide Convention and the important principle that these crimes could be committed in time of peace as well as in time of war. Uh, just to conclude, I think that what's so interesting now in, in recent times, with the elimination of this important difference between genocide and crimes against humanity, uh, is that the the debate about whether something is genocide or crimes against humanity becomes less and less significant, certainly in legal terms. Um, I, I dare say almost insignificant. We'll tease this out over the course of the day and the discussions. But even some of the other dimensions of the Genocide Convention that perhaps set it apart from crimes against humanity have become less and less significant. So that we have, we have a duty to prevent genocide in Article I of the Genocide Convention but now, since the outcome document of 2005, we have a responsibility to protect in cases of genocide and crimes against humanity and war crimes and ethnic cleansing. We have a court with jurisdiction not only over genocide, but also over crimes against humanity. We have the elimination of the nexus between the, the two, between crimes against humanity and war. Perhaps the only thing left of the Genocide Convention, which is a significant, we once thought highly significant distinction, is the fact that it gives jurisdiction to the International Court of Justice under Article 9. The recent judgment of the International Court of Justice suggests that that is probably a rather illusory remedy and not something that's going to be a very productive uh, approach. I think that the International Court of Justice, to jump the gun on the discussion later this afternoon, is essentially saying to us, if it's a case of genocide, maybe you're better off at the international criminal tribunals and definitely only come to us in the clearest of cases. And so ultimately, this tension between genocide and crimes against humanity, which gave birth to the Genocide Convention and gave birth to Resolution 96, is no longer really present. And the, the distinction and the use of the word from the legal standpoint, the use of the term genocide, um, is virtually insignificant. Remains, of course, of great importance symbolically. And that's another subject. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists. I'm very delighted that I couldn't see Michael or whoever else was waving time cards. Uh, do we have time for a few questions or do we tell a little bit? I just had one comment. Uh, excuse uh, me. I'm sorry, will you make it very brief? Because we really do want to have some questions. All right. Uh, we'll hold? My okay. lips are sealed. Okay, maybe during the break people can, can talk to Henry. Okay. Questions? Yes. You need a microphone right there. Uh, for the two gentlemen who were present in Nuremberg, 
could we have prosecuted the SS or the other defendants in Nuremberg using anything resembling the, the Anglo-Saxon and American rules of evidence? My understanding is that most of what we did was based on documentary evidence for whom there weren't very many living witnesses uh, to provide a foundation for their in, uh, introduction. And the reason I ask this is because that's one of the criticisms against the military commissions in Guantanamo. And my understanding is if we were bound to use rules of evidence as they apply in either our state or federal courts, we probably could not have convicted, uh, convicted the SS. The rules of evidence as applied in practice were all in favor of the accused. In some respects, unbelievably so. Hearsay evidence three times removed was always admitted. Uh, you'll find an article on my website written at that time, Nuremberg Trial Procedures and the Rights of the Accused. Uh, their evidence against them was so overwhelming, their own top secret reports specifying exactly what they were planning to do and how they did it, that they would be convicted in any court resembling any kind of justice, in my opinion. My recollection is the entire the main rule on uh, evidence at Nuremberg was relevancy. Um, we had uh, a pretty free hand in, uh, in, in, in introducing what we needed, but we didn't need uh, much more than the documents. Um, the defendants that I worked on tended to sound off, and they always had a transcript of the proceedings. So. What we did was read it back to them in, in the Nuremberg courtroom. That's a very important. It was a prosecutor's dream as far as I was concerned. And I had a defendant that uh, was always had more explosive than anybody else. And so what, we, what I did was read the documents back to him, and we got a life conviction. Anybody else? Yes. Start over. Uh, John Quigley. I'm wondering if the name Aaron Trinan uh, is familiar to the participants in, in the Nuremberg trial. He was a Russian law professor, wrote a book in 1944 called The Crimes of the Hitlerites. It was translated into English. It, it figures prominently in discussions that one can read about in documents in the publication Foreign Relations of the United States for 1943 and 44 when, when the uh, Roosevelt administration was, was in the midst of the discussion that Bill Chavis was talking about trying to figure out what to do. Um, uh, and, and he apparently is the first person to put in print the idea that anyone should be charged with a crime after the war as opposed to being taken out and shot. And he was apparently the first one to put into print the idea of having a tribunal that would, would not be simply uh, of a single power of the United States or the UK but would be a combined one at, at, at a quasi-international level. Uh, and also out of his documents apparently came the idea of prosecuting industrialists, which came out of the, you know, the Soviet idea that it was the capitalists in Germany who, who were the, the ones that, that were really responsible. Um, uh, well, I, I've never heard the man's name, but uh, it's pretty well established that Henry L. Stimson, together with Jackson, were the ones who pushed for a trial. Uh, Stimson was a man of great standing. He was Secretary of War, um, uh, a Republican who President Roosevelt relied on very greatly. And Roosevelt seemed to have been headed in the other direction at the, uh, the urging of Stalin and Churchill. So uh, I don't want to forget the importance of uh, Stimson uh, to the Nuremberg case. Because of his prestige, I mean, and he had great prestige, and we had all, we had most of the defendants in our custody. That was very important, too. Uh, and Jackson, of course, uh, in his speech before the American Society of International Law on April 12, 1945, one day after Roosevelt uh, died, um, said we had to have a trial, a fair trial, uh, no convictions without adequate evidence, supporting evidence. Um, those are at least, those two individuals played a major role in uh, 
pushing the United States, which was uh, the custodian of most of the defendants, in this direction. And Roosevelt, just before he died, seemed to have turned the corner. There seems to be no doubt, there was no doubt, that the Soviet view of the trials was that uh, they could take place, providing they ended up with guilty sentences and those responsible were executed. <laughs> As far as the industrialists were concerned, it was not only the Soviets were pressing. I don't think they were pressing at all. They were, didn't make such fine distinctions. But we knew that I.G. Farben, for example, had produced the money for the building of Auschwitz in order to have an unlimited labor supply. And there was a great deal of evidence to show the complicity of uh, industrialists as well as other segments of uh, German society with the crimes committed by the Nazis. That was a justification for the 12 subsequent trials. Some of those were acquittals. It was very difficult to prove the criminal intent in many of those cases. But uh, I wouldn't blame the Soviets for that. We blame it upon the, we don't blame it, but it's attributable to the uh, sense of fairness of the Nuremberg tribunals themselves. And Jackson, uh, sense of fairness is, replicated, is reflected in the fact that he wanted the defendants adequately defended. In other words, he got the Allied Control Commission to appropriate funds so that the Germans could choose their own lawyers. Henry, I he think... He wanted a documentary case, which was totally documentary, let the Germans convict themselves. Henry, excuse me, I think, I think Bill wanted to make one comment, and then we have time for one more question. I, even if I wasn't at the Nuremberg trial? Sure. You know? Please. Okay. Sure. I was born after the Nuremberg trial. <laughs> I was actually born about 200 yards from here at the Cleveland <laughs> Hospital. Yeah. Congratulations. Um, I wanted to... <laughs> 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 I'm back home. Um, I think that the, um, the, uh, a lot has been made about the debates during the war as to whether they would hold mass executions or summary executions or something. Um, but it's my belief that it, it was inevitable that you were going to have war crimes trials uh, after 1919 and that the debates in 1919 following the First World War, although they didn't lead to a satisfactory result, had launched the process where, and you couldn't turn the clock back anymore. And that while there was, I, I, we know that at the Tehran conference, Stalin and Churchill and Roosevelt sort of joked about, joke, you know, wasn't that funny, but I think they were all drunk anyway at that time. And they were chatting <laughs> about how many people they would execute. But they didn't, in practice, it was already a, a foregone conclusion that you had to go with the judicial route. Thank you. Okay, well, I hope you'll join me in thanking our panelists, and then we're going to break right now. All right. Uh, please take a 10-minute break, and we will start promptly at 10 minutes after 11, and we'll see you then. Thanks. Thank you all. <laughs>